Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones. And in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because politics needed a rebrand. Welcome back to Girl on the Gun, the podcast. Happy Wednesday. Well, how is it Wednesday? How, what? How was it Wednesday? How are we back here? How is it again? almost like the end of summer? That's don't, what's don't even so wild this. and insane to me. I I don't get no, it's literally the time crazy. Goes. I never like it always flies, but I feel like the summer has been so brutal weather wise. Like there's mm-hmm. barely been Agreed. a day where it's like either not smoky and totally smoked out or raining or both. So it just feels like I've never even seen the light. It's like if there's a rare sunny day, it's like, oh my God, yeah. what is this weird summer? I think it's going to be a but... hot girl fall. Oh, I'm intrigued. Look, I'm. Well, in SF, it's always, like, really nice here in the fall. It's honestly been pretty nice in July so far, but, like, honestly, all over California, it's been so gloomy since, like, May, and now July has been better, but then SF is when it gets, like, hot in the fall usually, which I'm very excited about. So, Mm. we're just, we're aiming for a hot girl fall. Mark your calendars. Hot girl fall. Interesting. Okay. I might have to just, like, sign myself up for that, but speaking of something, in this well I don't even want to call this like a struggle it's more of like an lol is one of our mutuals on tiktok who used to work on the hill has been doing this speaking of hot girls has been doing this series called like republican or democrat and I guess it's like a game that her and her friends used to play like while getting coffee like in the mornings like okay like based on aesthetic is that person that's potential staff or whatever they republican or democrat which is funny because I feel like I used to play something kind of similar with my friends on other various like levels but this was killing me first of all before i have us like play a few of these i'm curious like what your thoughts are i am so accidentally republican coded like not too exactly a t but there's enough of these like i'm definitely not democratic coded like at all no that like, definitely it's checks. very yeah, yeah i'm like oh my god like i yeah, no, just... that definitely checks you definitely yeah. give more fiscally conservative socially liberal though i will give you that <laughs> but this girl will wear heels like at yeah. all costs at all times even it's in true. her own home even when she has to walk 30 blocks like <laughs> I've never seen anything like it so once you see or hear this TikTok you'll you'll get what I'm saying because the the high heels are a apparently direct giveaway that somebody is Republican on the hill which is that one is I think the one that really like sealed it for me where I was like oh mm. Okay. Okay. Which makes okay, me gonna... feel very happy because I choose comfort overall, which is such a Democrat quality, you know? And I think I just, I'm coded, I'm coded D. I think you are, but like also still like adjacent to these, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's like, granted, neither of us, at least in, you know, our current positions have like worked on the Hill or like in an Uber like corporate or like you know formal yeah i mean the hill is even like beyond corporate it's very yeah. formal i was i showed up actually... in a leather jacket and sneakers so that's my vibe <laughs> at least it wasn't a sweatshirt <laughs> i mean shout out to senator fetterman for normalizing sweatshirts because maybe next the time i will show does. up in one well i'm literally not opposed if you are into fashion and into any type of look and I mean, L E W K look, Mm -hmm. then like DC is just like a hard place to be because you got to dress formal Capitol Hill. There's not very many options. Like if you work on the Hill, I feel like you got to like just just stay in line to be a revolution, a fashion revolution on the Hill. And maybe we're the ones to lead it. Yeah. This is clearly the most pressing issue in politics. today. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, wait, let's play. So first off, let me see. Anyway, House Number Two. So I will deliver. For those of you who are new, I worked for the House of Representatives for like five hundred women. I think the two biggest tells are their work bag and their shoes. So let's talk shoes. We're gonna start easy and get harder. Rothies. Okay, Rothies. What do you think? Yeah, that's like the that's the flats that I was thinking of. I wouldn't be caught dead in those, but I understand it's a common 
common shoe on the hill and 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 like kind of formal corporate America, which I've always stayed far away from. So I've never mm-hmm. had to go down that road. But an alternative for me that would still fall into the Democrat lane would be like a loafer. I like loafers right now. I knew you were gonna say that. Like the mm-hmm. elevate, like the like chunky loafer Ch- situation. Chunky loafer, I have a pair in the closet right now. Maybe that's why I'm thinking of it because I'm thinking mm-hmm. of that exact habit. Yeah, couldn't do it. Absolutely not. Don't like a flat. I don't also, or at least if it's going to be a flat, I need like some little like wedge heel situation. Like I have a few pairs of those, which honestly were like kind of gifted. Wouldn't have gone out and bought them myself. But I, but so. where I will, where I will draw the line is stilettos. Like I won't be wearing some what she's about to get into the Republican stiletto, I would still rather wear a Rothy because I just would rather be comfortable than, than wear those. Okay. Well, this is my thing with the stilettos is I love a super high heel, but I can't have something with a back. Like it just does not work for me. Like physically mm-hmm. can't. Okay, so heels like, I'm open to, to as well. Not like the mini, mini kittens, but like, you know, below three or like a mule. Chunky mule. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's get to the next one. No democratic. They're made out of like plastic water bottles, sustainability, eco, blah, 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 blah. I get it because these are so comfortable, but Republican. Okay. I saw some. The next one was Tory Birch flats. See, I just never been a flats girl. Like, I've always hated them. Like, I think since middle school. It's fair. Speaking of Tory Birch flats, just remind me. You allowed to show your toes? That was. I don't. Mm-hmm. I suspect no, or it's frowned upon. Yeah, my mind went to oh, I would wear like a flat, a flat with like my toes out, like a sandal, like an elevated sandal. But yeah, now that I think about it, it feels it feels wrong. Show your toes it's just on the, on the hill. I don't know why <laughs> they're so afraid because there's people bunch of losing money from their there. only fans that you know yeah. they're like hide the toes, don't save a dollar. My God. Mm-hmm. Well, apparently they're Republican coded. I totally see that. Totally agree. Absolutely, every single person that I know that owns those pairs of, owns that pair of shoes as a Republican, or like the at least Republican or grew up coded. one. <laughs> oh yeah, I think that's probably more accurate for sure. Okay, so wouldn't wear either. Next Back thing. Back and forth on this one, but the number one way to tell if it's a Republican. This is the stilettos. Democrats are not wearing stilettos. Doesn't even matter. I just have a question for my fellow Democrats. Why not? Because they're so chic. They're so adorable. They make you look I feel like Jess was wearing heels. Line. Yes, she was. Jess likes a, likes a good heel. And mm-hmm. she also is incredibly fashionable and has really, like, she, she has great are, hill style. What is the word that I'm looking for? Like matching suit thing, but like power suit. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. She just has great style, but a great seller, great high heel. What are we, are we just abandoning these beauties? The shoes that exist out there that we're just letting sit there that could yeah, change see, democracy not, as we know it? Not for me. I have some cute like pointed toe like shorter heels I would definitely wear, but they're like so uncomfortable. Like I really wouldn't be able to even walk through the fucking tunnel into the house chamber and those things, you know? I will say that floor was slippery. Yeah. Like, like and, and very there's like a really thin heel. So it's like, it's just uncomfortable. It feels like it's going to, you're on a still, it's just going to like break any second. It's, it's okay. We, we differ, you know, mm-hmm. and I will let that go. Okay, the next thing is a cap shoe. It bridges the divide of like preppy but also practical. I have this one from French Soul. What's a cap shoe? See how it's like the toes. Oh, oh. like that. So a pointed, I think it could be by pointed heel with some type of cap on it, different color block. Yeah, it goes on to say like it's very like there's a Chanel shoe like that, and there's a Chanel flat like that, and there's a Chanel shoe like that. So I just I feel like it's bipartisan to me. Maybe that's the shoe I that would bridges agree. the gap between us all. I would agree with that. Shoe diplomacy. Mm, there it is, folks. There it is. We've solved our, our problems. Well, that is our mm. data research briefing for the week. 
Very, very interesting <laughs> stuff. Very important stuff. But some more important stuff that we have on the docket today is our interview because we are talking all about unions, which is so relevant this week, given just oh God, all literally. of the union happenings from UPS and Teamsters reaching their agreement, just all the Solidarity Summer tings. So what a perfect conversation. Totally. So we were talking to Michelle from Starbucks Workers United. So naturally, we're talking about that specific movement, how it got going, essentially like Starbucks workers and their fight against corporate and trying to unionize all the different stores, the tactics that Starbucks has used against them. And also I thought was so interesting too, is our conversation around how Starbucks had marketed themselves forever, sort of like I hate using the term woke, but like more liberal, more progressive Mm -hmm. corporation, which you could critique that exact statement, but just for, you know, the speed of it all. And then seeing them act like this towards their workers and sort of that contrast, like what happened? Where was that breakdown maybe in communication or just in reality and all those different things? So super interesting. We also talk about a few classic union related term so if there's ones you've been seeing in the news you're like what is going to bargaining like excuse me what is union busting i don't know you'll find out here so nonetheless without further ado here's michelle all right hello michelle welcome to girl in the Cup of the podcast we are so excited to have you I'm really pumped to be here. It's done quite a few podcasts, but I love it when I know it's being geared towards, you know, sort of a younger generation. They're the, they're the future, especially in the labor movement. So it's cool to be able to come in and talk about that. Totally. Could not agree more. And the labor movement specifically that we're going to talk about is Starbucks Workers United. Can you tell us about this movement, how you got involved? What does this all look like? Sure. I guess it makes sense to start kind of with my origin story with the company, and then that'll take us into my involvement with the, with the campaign itself. I started with Starbucks in 2010. So it's been quite some time. I came to the company because I have a a career in the arts. I'm a production stage manager, um, which I love, but you know, it's a job in the arts. So it almost never comes with health benefits and, and mine did not. And you often need some sort of supplemental income. So I needed a company that could offer me part-time work where I could, where I was eligible for health benefits. And that was what Starbucks, that's what they build themselves on. You know, come to work for Starbucks. We're flexible. We'll work around your school, we'll work around your other endeavors. We want you to have a life outside of this, of this, you know, form of employment. So I started with them. I had been a longtime customer before that point. And so I knew they had a reputation for taking care of their communities and, you know, wanting to take care of the environment and for taking care of their employees. And I think for at least for the early few years I was with the company, I really believed that they were that company. You know, I felt taken care of. I felt valued. You know, I had a, they were very flexible. I was able to get them health benefits that I came in for. And then there was a, a shift. Things definitely started to shift. And this is pre-pandemic. And I'm making that point because, you know, the catalyst for what we're seeing in the labor movement right now really was the pandemic. It was, you know, it was, it was a moment for workers, especially workers like myself, who were all of a sudden found themselves in the category of being called essential, you know, by these workplaces, even though we were continually treated as disposable started to sort of take stock of where they fell kind of in the in the world of of their workplace and that's where that's why we're where we are today but with starbucks this sort of shift happened a little bit before the pandemic you know i saw benefits that were offered to us just sort of taken away without any conversations you know i saw different bonuses or different value that was once placed on their employees just just sort of slipped away very slowly. And if you weren't paying attention, it was like a a frog in a pot of boiling water. You really had to sort of like stop and go, oh, wait a minute, that was something I had last year. And now I don't have that. What that doesn't make any sense to me. And so the, you know, I kind of started thinking, you know, what, what's going on? Is this really the, is this the company that I, that I wanted to work for? Is it worth it for me to be here anymore? What's, what's going on? And then of course the pandemic hit, right? And Starbucks stayed open. Starbucks stayed open through the entirety of the pandemic. We were in, we were, you know, we couldn't zoom in our jobs. You can't zoom in making a latte. So we were showing up to these shops. We were customer facing long before a vaccine was even on the horizon. And 
this company just failed to take care of us. You know, on paper, they were saying your, your safety is of our utmost importance and we're reevaluating the situation every single day. And in the meantime, the first round of masks that they sent us for PPE was made out of cut up t-shirt material. Like we're not even talking like medical grade masks. We're talking like facial coverings that were like, these were, I, I have a couple of promotional Starbucks t-shirts that I know are made out of this material. So you can't tell me that that's didn't just sort of, it wasn't yeah, sort of a you standard. You didn't just chop these up in the back. No. So for me, the the kicker was most of our, most counties in the country had mask mandates. You know, a mandate is a temporary law. It's, you know, it's a law, something that needs to be followed. And Starbucks wasn't enforcing these mask mandates. It was against company policy, essentially, to enforce this mask mandate, as, as they would say it. Their policy was to de-escalate the situation, i.e., we still want you to serve this unmasked customer, their caramel macchiato, because that five ninety nine sale is more important to us than your safety. Mm-hmm. And then with the real, the final sort of nail in the coffin for me, where I was like, what am I even doing here? And I was at a point where I was ready to go. You know, I was like, I don't know where I'm going to go. The arts had completely shut down during the pandemic. But at this point, it's like spring, summer of 2021. So I've worked through a year of the pandemic with Starbucks. I'm hoping that the arts are about to reopen. Like I'm getting like emails. I'm getting requests to come in and and potentially pick up some work. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to go. I don't know where I'm going to go. I guess I'll figure out this benefits thing later. But mm-hmm. I can't continue to work for this company. We've got a CEO who is on, you know, MSNBC and CNN every other week bragging about these record breaking profits. The company made millions over pre pandemic profits. I mean, that's what we need to take into account. They stayed open because they saw a market for it. Mm-hmm. They didn't stay open because they felt a need to serve the community. And, you know, they felt like they were filling, they saw if we stay open and we're the only people who stay open, who is, they're going to come to us. That's the way that it's going to work. And meanwhile, I've got coworkers in the back room of our store who are crying because working 40 hours a week for this multi-billion dollar multinational corporation, they don't know if they're going to be able to pay rent and put groceries in their fridge. And it's just yeah. things are not translating. So I was like, I'm just going to go. I don't know. I'm going to give it a couple months and then I'm just going to figure out hopefully I'll have some contracts and I'll be able to just plod my way through it until things open permanently. And uh, I got a text message not long after I made that decision from a coworker. And she was like, hey, do you want to get a coffee after one of our shifts next week? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like we do that. We sell coffee all day. But yeah, we can. Why not? (laughs) Where are we getting where are we getting coffee? (laughs) So so I thought, you know, this is a coworker who I liked. I didn't know her super, super well. She had only been with the company maybe less than a year at that point. And I thought she wanted to promote up. There was a supervisor position that was coming open at the store, which I had held previously. I had been with the company a long time. Everyone knew that. I was often asked for advice when it came to stuff like that. And I was like, oh, she probably just wants to, you know, see if she, if she has what it takes to, to do this job. But I was like, sure. And that's not what she wanted to talk about. And said she, she wanted to ask me what I thought about trying to unionize our store. And I was like, whoa, no, I didn't. I've never thought about that. I don't really know that much about it. I do know what I know about unions and I'm, you know, I'm pro, but what I know about them is it's, it's very, unusual for it to be in the service industry. There's not a whole lot of unionized baristas that I'm aware of, but I wanted to know what her thoughts were. And so we had about a half hour conversation where she sort of laid it out there. There was a group of, at this point, maybe 50 Starbucks baristas in Buffalo who had been talking just about the conditions and how deplorable they were and how we didn't feel taken care of. We knew the company had the ability to do better. We just needed to, you know, open their eyes up to that. And at the end of it, she said, so what do you think? And I asked a couple of legal questions, you know, can I get fired for this? You know, where, yeah. what are, what are our protections? And she laid it out there. This is our right with this, within this country to, you know, organize our workplace. We're protected by the National Labor Relations Act, which I think came about in 1936. You know, we have protections. That does not mean that the company is going to obey the law, which we, found in many instances, but Starbucks has not. But at that point, we didn't know. We had no reason to believe that they weren't going to. I said, but listen, I'm about to go back into rehearsals like next week. I just got I just got a gig and I don't think I'm going to be able to commit a whole lot of time to this. So what do you need from me right now? She said, right. could you, would you want to publicly sign your name to a letter to Kevin Johnson, letting him know that we want to unionize? Kevin Johnson was the CEO at the time. And I was like, yeah, that's it. 
that's all you need? And she was like, yeah, you know, you've been with the company for a really long time. We feel like your name would carry some weight. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, take my name. That's it. That's like the, that's the heavy list. And it, obviously that was very naive. So I had no way of knowing how that was going to be received by the company. We had to go public about a week later because, you know, the way organizing works is about building relationships with people and having one-on-one conversations. And you take a risk when you talk to, you know, a worker that you can, you know, can I trust you that I'm talking to you about this? Or are you going to go run to a manager? And at one point, we, you know, they spoke to someone who couldn't be trusted and that person ran to a manager and we were like, oh, okay, I guess we're going, guess we're going public, ready or not. And then kind of the world sort of cracked open and Buffalo, New York, you know, where my store is located, sort of found itself at the epicenter of this crazy Starbucks Workers United movement that we are in the middle of right now. Oh, my goodness. What a story. Well, I, you know, like you said, like this, what is the mission really of Starbucks Starbucks Workers United? That's the story. That's kind of like your origin story. But like, what came next? Like, what was how, how did this kind of form into this bigger entity? So next, what came was, you know, our hand was forced. We had to go public. But when we went public with the campaign, all of our social media went public on the same day. And that, that was the moment where we sort of realized this is much bigger than us. This is much bigger than 50 baristas in Buffalo, New York, because Starbucks had sort of fostered this kind of network of baristas across the country and across the world. They they wanted you to connect with work with Starbucks workers all over the place. They had a they, they have a famous hashtag to be a partner that you see everywhere. And they want Starbucks workers to use this hashtag to be able to connect with each other. So as soon as we went public, Starbucks workers from across the country started reaching out and going, wow, this is amazing. This is exactly what we need. You know, all of the things that you're talking about that are going on in your stores in Buffalo, we're experiencing some, you know, we're experiencing here in Mesa, Arizona. We're experiencing them here in Knoxville, Tennessee. You know, this is all happening to all of us. And they wanted to know if we were going to be able to pull it off. And so they watched, you know, everybody watched. And we kind of had to to recognize the weight of that sort of on your shoulders that, you know, this isn't about at this at the beginning of the campaign, essentially how it works for organizing is you have to get enough support to be able to file a union petition. And the support is actually only 30 percent like in a store. So if you've got a store of 20 baristas, you know, you only need something like, I don't know, eight or less to be able to, okay. to file for a petition. But it's risky. So you want to try to get as much support as possible. And how you do that is you pass what's called union cards. And it's basically a worker, you know, saying, yes, I support this this campaign and I want to 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 organize my workplace. And so we only did that at three stores at first in Buffalo. It was like, let's see what stores can get to a majority first. And those are the three petitions we're going to file. So we're only talking about maybe 60 workers total at this point. But we know we've got thousands, you know, watching us from across the country and in some cases from, you know, around the world, mm -hmm. just kind of sitting, waiting to see if we were going to pull it off. And we did, you know, it took a few months and it took a lot of awful behavior by the company and a lot of violating U.S. labor law and just yeah, what is what most people are calling the most egregious union busting campaign in modern, you know, labor history which is being perpetuated by a company that's supposed to be better, you know, by a progressive company that, you know, shouldn't by any means stand for any of this if you read their mission statement. But we did it anyway. You know, on December yeah. 9th of 2021, we won. And that was it. I mean, that was like, all bets were off. As soon as it w people knew it was possible, you had petitions being filed like left and right all over the country. And as of today, actually, I don't even have a good number for you. Two days ago, we reached 330 unionized locations across the country in just about a year and a half, which is pretty astounding. Wait, I'm yeah. so curious too. Do you know how many stores there are in the country and how many employees I do. like in the stores? Oh my God, I'm so curious. There's a so, um, on every corner, I swear. There are. And you have to you have to figure out, is it a licensed store? Is it a corporate store? As far as corporate stores go, which is are the ones that are organizing, there's just under 9,000 in the country which is huge. And oh that's gosh. about just under, I think just under about 350,000 workers, our, like 
I believe workers that would be able to organize. So you you have to sort of management cannot unionize. So it's it's sort of the hourly workers that are able to unionize. And in Starbucks, it would be a barista or a shift supervisor. So I think that's about three hundred and fifty thousand. We are at about three hundred and thirty, maybe a little more at this point. Stores, which is about eight thousand, you know, workers. So that's yeah. eight thousand unionized workers in in a fairly short amount of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. wild. And I also have like a technical question in terms of doing the petitions. Like, who did you like hand those into? Like, who is like saying like, okay, these petitions mean X Y Z thing? Like, what's the what's the process there? So you file it with the NLRB, which is the National Labor Relations Board, which is the agency, okay. which is the federal agency, who is sole purpose is to make sure that the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA, is upheld, and that you know workers' rights are protected using this sort of series of U.S. labor law. And they're the entity charged with overseeing all of that. Got it. Okay. Because I was like, wait a second. Like, where does that go? How does that all connect? But that makes a lot of sense. In terms of the, like, next steps for this movement and getting people involved, like, what does that typically look like? How do you, like, add more stores to this movement, you know, what does that look like? And also, side note, the way a hashtag backfired, I gotta <laughs> love to see it. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> early days of this campaign, it was, you know, just this handful of workers in Buffalo who managed to figure this out. And all of these workers from across the country are now reaching out to like we had a we had a centralized email account. And they're sending emails, you know, dozens of emails a day. I'm from this store in this city and I'm talking to my workers and we want to organize and how do you help us? And we're physic, we're getting on calls with these workers. You know, like I'm yeah. scheduling Zoom calls with workers all over the country at whatever time they're available to talk, if it's 11 o'clock at night, whatever. And we're handling all of that. And then it quickly, 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 quickly spiraled. So I should mention, we organized, it, this is not like Amazon Labor Union, which is an independent union, like they established their own union. Starbucks Got Workers it. United are Starbucks workers that chose to organize with a, with a well-known union called Workers United, who goes all the way back to like the garment industry in mm-hmm. New York City at like the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. So they have a long-standing reputation, but what they did was let the workers at these stores take the lead. They were basically like, look, we're here to support you in whatever way, but we're not going to step on your toes. Here's, you know, some financial backing. Here's whatever you need to, to do this, but we're going to let you sort of lay out this course because you don't, you know, we don't know what it's like to work in a Starbucks. You, you know what it's like to work in a Starbucks. So as these, these sort of stores started reaching out and we, it just started snowballing. We had to call in reinforcements. So then we started having to develop like national committees who were, you know, this committee is in charge of intake calls and this committee is in charge of media and this committee is in charge of, you know, contract proposals. And these were all committees made up of workers, of Starbucks yeah. workers, either who had organized or were hoping to organize. And then just as of a couple months ago, on top of Workers United, SEIU, which is sort of the ind- Workers United is an independent affiliate of SEIU, which is a a much bigger union in this country. It's the Service Employees International Union, I believe is what it is the acronym for. Mm -hmm. And they were able to come in and say, "Okay, clearly, you know, Starbucks is still fighting this tooth and nail and these workers are still fighting. So we're going to continue to support you. So next steps is exactly kind of what I'm talking about. It's just workers keep wanting to organize in spite of what I think is kind of miraculous is that in spite of the company's very public bad behavior towards the union, and it's become very public at this point, they've violated U.S. labor law. The the National Labor Relations Board has found that they've violated U.S. labor law at this point, you know, thousands of times, which is just insanity. There are still workers who wake up, you know, and they're like, you know what? I don't care. I want to organize my Starbucks and they're reaching out and they're willing to do that in spite of what they know is potentially going to come down on them. You know, Starbucks has illegally fired, you know, workers for expressing a desire to organize their stores. You know, these workers are like, you know what? That's a risk I'm willing to take. I don't know if I would have been that brave, you know, if I hadn't been so naive, if I hadn't been at store number one, if I'd been store 100, would I have been brave enough to to like put it all out on the line? And there are Mm -hmm. still hundreds of workers a day who are like, yeah, we're going to do it. Because we feel yeah. like we deserve yeah. better. Well, to sort of that point and something you said earlier, too, about for stirring at Starbucks is like this is supposed to be a more progressive company and more oriented in that direction. And 
being progressive, that usually means, not always, but is usually a pro-union stance. And so I'm curious from your perspective where that went so awry. Like, where did that, like, dissolution of values seem to go? I mean, I know business is business, but, like, still, if you're using a set of values to create profit, you have to walk the walk usually. So I'm curious how they sort of managed to separate those and get us here. I wish I had an answer to that question. I still, to this day, am actually kind of shocked because I have watched this company make mistakes. I have watched them make some fairly serious missteps and then I've watched them be called out for it and then I've watched them fix it. I've watched them say, listen, you know, that was the wrong choice. We're sorry. Here's what we're going to do now. And so that's really what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting them to be immediately like falling all over themselves to let their workers unionize. But I was expecting them to sort of realize, you know what, we're on the right side of history here. You know, we can do what Starbucks has always been known for doing, which is set the standard. Like they could easily set the standard and the world would applaud them. They would be the heroes in this situation. Totally. So the fact that we're we're not there yet is still kind of mind boggling to me. Yeah. I'm going to say something that I've said a couple of times, so it's not a secret. We're fighting more than anything here is Howard Schultz's ego. You know, Howard is the founder of the company. He came back after this. He had he'd stepped down. He actually came back after the union drive started, essentially forced Kevin Johnson to resign and basically said, listen, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to fix all of this and this union thing is going to go away. And, you know, it didn't. In fact, him coming back only sort of ignited more of a flame because he came back and he said, I'm going to grant all these amazing benefits. I'm back, guys. Hey, here's all these great benefits, but I'm not giving them to any of the union workers. So if you want these benefits, you can't unionize your workplace, which is also illegal and has been, yeah. you know, they, the, the board has found merit in the fact that you can't come back and do this. And the benefits that they granted, they were the asks of the union. Like we were like, hey, the company so doesn't have seniority pay. Oh, absolutely. It's totally petty. So yeah. and I get it to some degree. I get it. You know, you can't. Here's this man and he's being told that his life's work is not as good as he thinks it is. And that can't sit well. That's got to be a hard pill to it's swallow. It's like a PR um, nightmare. Like, uh, right. So and, you know, I think famously he just he just testified in front of a, the Senate Health Committee back in March. And he was basically called, called up and said, you know, we want you to answer for the way you've been treating your workers. You know, this is we have laws in this country that are supposed to prevent corporations from treating workers like this. Why are you doing this? And he wasn't going to do it. He was going to try to get out of it. And then Bernie Sanders was like, OK, well, we're just going to subpoena you. I have subpoena power so I can subpoena you. And all of a sudden, Howard's like, oh, no, I'm available. What day is it? Oh, sure, sure. I can be yeah. there. And so he did. And in there, you know, he's there and they're like, listen, you did this. You've done this. You've done this. You've done this. And he he's sitting there and he's doubling down on defending the behavior of the company. And I'm I'm in the room with a lot of other Starbucks workers. And I'm like, what? This is surreal, right? And he has that. He made this very famous statement that got a lot of press where he's like, I earned my billions. I'm the one who earned those billions. And you've got I know you've got workers who could have cared less about this campaign initially who are sitting there going, no one earns billions. No one no one single handedly earns billions yeah. of dollars. That money is yeah. made off of the labor, the exploitation right. of the labor of other people. So it's been a it's been a wild ride. It's been a really, really wild ride. <laughs> no, I I love that. Nobody earns billions. I'm using that forever. Well, I feel like we can, we'll dive in a little bit more in a sec, but I want to take a second to like define some terms and get into our I have a stupid question segment because we have a few. And our first one is what's a bargaining session? How does this like play into this type of work? So in theory... Once you've won your union and it's been certified, which usually as long as things go correctly and it, you know, like the Amazon labor union right now is is fighting because Amazon's not recognizing the fact that they won their union. So they're still fighting sort of that kind of recognition. We didn't have to fight that. You know, we won and someone was like, oh, OK, you won. And the, the board, you know, certified us. The next step is bargaining a contract. And so a bargaining session refers to, you know, sitting across a table either virtually or, you know, in person with representatives from the company and usually their legal team and then worker representatives and potentially some representatives from the union. And you start the negotiations. 
and you hand proposals across and you say, you know, like, here's the health and safety proposal that the company that the, the union has come up with and you hand it over to them. And then the company looks at it and maybe asks questions and comes back with a counter proposal. And at some point, if you're bargaining in good faith, the idea is that both parties want to reach an agreement. You know, you want to, to have a contract that works for both sides. We are in a place with Starbucks where they have not bargained in good faith in any sense of that word. And so, you know, that's a really frustrating place to be because, you know, it's something like my store won 550 days ago or something like that. That's 550 days that we've been a union that we haven't had a contract because mm. the company is unwilling to actually, you know, sit down and negotiate one. Yeah. So I think this kind of gets into what's going to be the next question, which what is which is what is union busting? But is it essentially like a tool or a method for just never actually allowing something to unionize is to just keep the negotiating like going on bust, forever? Almost. Yeah, totally. Like, is there a limit to how long a bargaining period can go on or no? Not this country, unfortunately. So the the National Labor Relations Act, which came into play in 1936, over the decades has been completely gutted, mostly by Republican, you know, presidents and and you know it, it's it's been gutted to you know favor the corporations to help the corporations and to take power away from the workers there are some countries like canada for example has labor law that says i think it's something like if an agreement hasn't been reached within six months then like a third party arbitrator or mediator is brought in to be like we're getting a contract and it's happening right but there's no limitation in this country there's no like end point for a corporation or even a union for that matter to have to reach an agreement on a contract, which is goes into your question, what is union busting? Because union busting looks different depending on what side of the fight you're on. Before you've won your union, it looks like what, you know, some of the stuff Starbucks pulled here, which was shipping in hundreds of out-of-town managers, stationing them in our stores so that, you know, we were always being surveilled. Uh, calling us to, into what the company would like to call listening sessions, but what is more commonly known as captive audience meetings, which is essentially forcing workers to sit in a room and listen to anti-union talking points. They say they're they're not mandatory meetings, but they also say if you want to get paid for your shift, you have to come and sit in this room and listen to us talk. So okay, if you're telling an mandatory. hourly worker, <laughs> right. So if you're telling an hourly worker that who's living paycheck to paycheck, that they won't get paid for their shifts because you've had to close their store in order to hold this meeting unless they come to this meeting that's no longer optional you know people right. need people need to pay their bills they did a mass hire here in Buffalo so they took all the hiring out of the store manager's hands and they brought in outside recruiters and they packed what they did was pack the unit so they did all of this over hiring and put all of these extra workers into each of these stores in order to get those <laughs> names on the voter list in the hopes that those new workers would vote no, you know. So it's this like is, literally all... the gerrymandering of unions. Like that's absolutely what this sounds like cracking yeah. and packing. Yeah, it's cr it, and that's you know they did. There was also you know bribery. There was closing down stores and holding pizza parties. There was you know taking 16, 17 year old baristas out to lunch with the you know president of Starbucks North America who makes four million dollars a year, and she's like. Yeah, you're definitely going to be our next district manager, 17 year old who hasn't graduated from high school yet. You know, so there there are things like that. Um, that's the side that's the like leading up to the election. That's what they do to try to stop the union from going through to begin with. On the other side of it, union busting looks like, you know, what we're talking about, not coming to the table in good faith, draw, dragging out the negotiation process so that people get exhausted and frustrated basically using the bargaining process to further bust the union. For us, it was, you know, the first Elmwood session. Basically, the way the, a bargaining session is broken down is you sort of agree that you're going to focus on non-economic issues first, which can be health and safety, which can be organizing rights, which can be dress code, you know, stuff along those lines. And then yeah. you focus on the economic stuff. So benefits, wages, stuff like that. Well, we had a session and we had like seven or so non-economic proposals ready and they were really good. We were really proud of them. And the next day they went into all of these other stores that were petitioning to be a union and they took our proposals and they l basically laid them out and they said, this is the only thing the union's asking for. They're not even asking for wage improvements. They're not even asking for better benefits. This is it. This is the entirety of the contract. And we were like, whoa, no, it's not. <laughs> it was 
it was the very first session, you know, where that's this is completely untrue. So they try to use what's happening in bargaining to, you know, discount the union even more. And that, again, is another form of union busting. What is so interesting here to me is it seems like the amount of money and organization and time that they have to spend and are spending trying to bust unions, trying to prevent unionization is costing them more than it would to just agree to the terms of letting these stores unionize and pay fair wages, all the different situations. And so like, look, I'm stubborn. I have a huge ego. I get it to a point. And then there's got to be like people around you that have to be like, this is dumb. And if you really care that much about the money, you're losing it. Well, especially if they're coming in and like, you know, offering the benefits that the union's asking for the non-unionized workers. So it's like, exactly. You don't clearly you don't care about the money or it's going to take to actually give these benefits. So yeah. Is it really just ego at the end of the day? It's, you know, it's, it's power, right? It's not financial. It's if there was ever a company on this planet that could afford to take care of its workers in whatever way we ask them to, it's a company like Starbucks. They could absolutely do it. And you're right. They're bleeding. They have to be bleeding money. You know, the amount of money they yeah. hired right off the bat, Littler Mendelssohn, which is a known anti-union law firm. Somewhere on their website, it says that their, their purpose is for like union avoidance or something like that. And, you know, that's costing millions upon millions of dollars right? It would have been much easier to just come in and negotiate a contract. But what they're fighting is the fact that what we, what our ask has always been and where my goal has been is to have a voice in my workplace. You know, especially during COVID when we were watching these health and safety sort of protocols be handed down, no one was ever coming into these stores and asking us what we needed to protect ourselves. They were in some ivory tower in Seattle coming up with these and then sending them down to us. And we were just being told that we had to adhere to them. That's not what it, that's not a democratic workplace. You know, if you're not having conversations with your workers and they don't actually have an opinion and, you know, the policies and procedures that they're being forced to adhere to, you, you're never, there's always going to be a significant power imbalance. And that's what we're fighting. We're fighting the fact yeah. that they don't want to have to sit across from the table from their hourly workers and actually listen to what we have to say about the, how the company is being run. And Howard having the ego that he has, that's not something that he's, that's not something that he's interested in. But here, here we are. We've got a new, we've got a new CEO who's just come on board in April, Lakshman Nair Simhan. He has an opportunity, in my opinion, to write that course. He has an opportunity to be like, do I really want this to be my legacy? Like, do I want to be associated with the largest union investing campaign in modern labor history? Is that what I want? And there's a part of me that is hopeful that he's going to wake up one morning and be like, no, I don't. I don't want to have anything to do with this. Let's get to the table. Let's negotiate a contract and let's, you know, move forward in the new dynamic that is Starbucks, which is gonna and people will cheer you know the world will forget everything that they did to us in the last 18 months because that's that's what starbucks has the power to do yeah right and it is so interesting because we've seen since the pandemic a really big push for organizing for unions and so like even from a pr perspective them making this like change at the top and then if they like leaned into it like it is the perfect move, whether you're going for the moral reasons, which you should be doing too, or the PR, like, yeah, I just, the money. I don't know where it's interesting to me. It's just like, where did union become or unionizing become a bad word, especially for a progressive company? Like, if we were talking about Home Depot, like, who has like a wackadoodle, like, right wing CEO slash founder, I'd be like, okay, like, I don't agree with it, but I see exactly like the direct line of thought and how this happens. And like, the the values and the morals are just totally different. But this to me is like so wacky because it's just so separated from what it seems like the original yeah. mission and intent and all this stuff was. And I don't know. I just it, can't quite get past that. It's just why it doesn't make any sense. It makes zero sense. And it, you're not the, the only person. I mean, people are just like this. This isn't tracking. Yeah. You know, this doesn't. This doesn't track. And I don't have a good answer for you. People are. You know, I've been asked what if you could ask Howard one question, what would it be. And it would just literally be like, dude, what are you doing? You are ruining your yes. brand. You are, yeah. you are screwing this up totally. so bad. Yeah. No, it's like literally like one for Duncan and negative one for Starbucks. You know, like if we're like talking like big, big chain coffee brands, 
but yeah i mean there's so much there and i'm also like curious too with a lot that you mentioned earlier about all the illegal stuff that they do like firing workers who try to unionize what are the repercussions for that if any or is there any movement on holding them accountable on those things that they're like doing time and time again that are actually illegal like what's is there any movement on that front as far as accountability so yes so anytime something like that happens what we file what's called a ULP which is an unfair labor practice charge and we file that through the the attorneys that are representing the union and therefore representing those workers. And then that goes to the National Labor Relations Board and they investigate that. You know, they talk to the worker, they talk to the witnesses, and they basically try to find out if there's merit to that charge. Very, very, very few of the thousands of ULPs that have been filed in this campaign have been found to have no merit. Almost all of them have been found to have merit. Once a merit once merit has been determined by the NLRB, then it go, then the NLRB prosecutes Starbucks. And that goes that to is. a hearing, a federal hearing, where the NLRB presents evidence, you know, to support the charges that they found merit to. And the company has to come in and basically defend themselves and prevent evidence to the, to the contrary. So there have been, there are dozens of ULP hearings happening in cities all over the country, all about, all in regards to, to Starbucks. So the government, federal government taking Starbucks to court saying you violated U.S. labor law. We just had one. We've had two so far in Buffalo. I think there's a third one that's about to happen. But the first one took place last summer and we called it Buffalo One because there's so many. And it encompassed something like over 200 allegations of, of violations of the NLRA. And we got a decision on March 1st from the, the judge. So this started in July, wrapped in September, took until March 1st for the judge to hand down the decision because the decision was so staggering. It was like 200 plus pages, which is just unprecedented. And it was saying, yeah, Starbucks did break the law hundreds of times in Buffalo alone, just between the months of this month and this month. We're not even looking at anything beyond that. And so the... When you talk about remedies, that's what they refer to as like, what's the solution now that they've been found guilty? Yeah, like again, it, it's kind of lackluster in in the terms of like the fired workers. It's ordering their reinstatement, making them whole, which means like making sure that, the, you know, they get all of the back pay that they would have made, you know, had they not been fired. It, there's a there's a new general counsel for the NLRB who is been in place a couple of years, but she's made a lot of progress in saying, listen, we need to protect workers to the best of our ability. So beyond saying this worker was fired unlawfully, now they get reinstated and they get, you know, six months worth of back pay. They also need to, if they lost their house because they couldn't make their mortgage payment, we need to get them their house back. If they lost their car because they couldn't make their car payment, if they lost their health benefits, you need to make them completely whole. It's not enough to just give them, you know, six months of back pay. So that's one of the remedies. You know, other remedies can be something, I'm going to use the word silly. I, I hate to even say that, but like one of them was like, Howard Schultz has to record a video admitting to all of the laws that have been broken. And it has to be shown to every Starbucks, not just every organized Starbucks, every single Starbucks in the country needs to watch a video of their CEO admitting to breaking the law and saying, I'm not going to do it again, essentially, which you know, not not the most significant of remedy, but if it is, you know, a CEO on record stating that he violated the law hundreds of times over and that he's going to stand down and like not not get in the way of his workers right to organize. That is something, you know, that is potentially we've now got you on record saying you're not going to fire people anymore for trying to organize. So don't do it. Yeah, I actually must think crazy. that it might even be the more effective strategy because it like embarrasses him. So it's no, like actually it's serving like, the punishment like directly and it's like creating a feedback loop that I think actually like does more than what it looks like on the surface. And I think it was like the video has to be posted on all of Starbucks like official sites and it has to be made available for the duration of our organizing campaign. So it's not like just for a week. So like say, you know, say we're still organizing <clears throat> corporate Starbucks in eight years. They people should still be able to go in and access this. Now I know it does not sound 
significant. Trust me, as someone no. who's been fighting, who's watched their coworkers fired for stuff like that, who's, you know, it's the labor laws in this country need some help. They yeah. need some serious, serious help. The PRO Act, if the PRO Act were ever to be passed, that would be a step in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, the fact that like, obviously there's, it's hard with the corporation because there's obviously a lot of people making decisions, but you do have a CEO who's at the top, like putting their stamp of approval. And so it's like 200 plus counts of illegal acts doesn't equate to a potentially, you know, a prison sentence or a massive, massive right. settlement or some, something. It's like, yeah. why is there no legal accountability for the decision maker at the top? Like, so much of that is just so backwards. But we want to wrap up with kind of understanding too, like how people can support this movement. Looks like we got a question that is boycotting helpful picket lines. <clears throat> like, what does the best assistance look like for that? Okay. So, part. Part of our fight is fighting Starbucks brand, right? Starbucks is recognizable all over the world. It's generally associated with a good company, a company that you want to spend your money. So, you know, I think what I'm looking to is we need to sort of rebrand this company. First, we need to debrand and, and let people know that, you know, no, their money is not supporting good things when they when they go to Starbucks. So if you can go to Dunkin', sure, by all means, go to Dunkin', go to a local coffee shop. We have a couple of, of coffee shops that have unionized in Buffalo that are not, you know, Starbucks. And I'm like, go there. They're, they're union. They've negotiated a contract. So I'd say, yeah, if you can avoid it. We've lost some really amazing regular customers at my store, not because they don't support us, but because they've decided they no longer want to support the company. And so they're like, listen, until Starbucks gets its act together, we're just going to go down the street and get our coffee somewhere else. So yeah, if you are able to do that, if you aren't, and if you want to go in and there's the flip side, which is the workers who are organizing, you know, they're going through it. They're going through it. You know, so if you can go in and be like, hey, we're, we're proud of you, you know, keep up the fight. Here's an extra five bucks for your tip jar. And one of the other union busting things they did early on was cut everybody's hours. You know, so like workers who are working 30 hours, 35 hours a week, all of a sudden we're being scheduled 12 hours a week because, you know, that's how you weed people out. That's how you so they're not going to illegally fire you, but they're essentially going to force you out because they're not giving you enough hours to be able to pay your bills. So if you have the ability to go in and be like, you know, here's that. If you do see a store on strike, we've had a, a crazy amount of strikes on this campaign and there will be a whole bunch to come. Don't cross the picket line. I mean, I think that's generally pretty standard. If you want to join the picket line, they they would be happy to have you. They'll give you a sign. They'll give you some stickers. There's usually a tip jar that's with the picket line to sort of try and compensate the lost, you know, some of the lost wages and tips that come with walking out of your workplace. I think it's just continued recognition that what the company is doing is not right. And it's hard. It's hard to fight that because there are still people you know, I feel like I've fully immersed in this in the last 20 months, but there are people who still have no idea what we've been doing or what we've been fighting and still are like, yeah, Starbucks is great. And I'm like, mm -hmm. are they? Are they the coffee even that good? <laughs> Getting into where they source their coffee is a whole nother probably conversation. Absolutely. That's also something that is being, you know, I don't even want to use looked into because it's more serious than that. But yes, you know, yeah. they have been agencies who are like, hey, why don't we go to the source and see right. how this company actually gets its product? Yeah. You know, you know, and also their prices, I feel like, are starting to get the same as like a local like kind of craft coffee shop. They're all around like the five to six dollar range for a latte Starbucks or like a local smaller business. It's like go to smaller business. They're usually Absolutely. better coffee and yeah, better practice, but yeah. Well, nonetheless, thank you so much for walking us through where the movement's at, how it began, and of course, how people can get involved. So thank you so much. It's been great chatting with you. Yeah, thank you so much, so much. 